So what we're going to be looking at um, in, uh, in Matthew chapter 8, and I'm going to try to take over the TVs up there. Let's see. Hopefully everything will work okay. We'll see. I was having some trouble with these things earlier this morning, so... gonna work wow sometimes I'm almost amazed when stuff works right you use the technology it's like you're risking stuff but um just to try to give you kind of a the storyline here uh, in Matthew chapter 8 Jesus and he's he's been talking to a bunch of other people about following him and he and his disciples go across the the, uh, the Sea of Galilee, and they come into the area of the Gadarenes. And as he as he as they get out of the ship, they meet this demoniac. Actually, it's about two guys. Really, is when you when you start looking at the scriptures. And these two guys, they're filled with demons, and they're and they're acting crazy. And I don't know if you're like me. But uh, one of the things that when I read accounts like this, I'm left with a lot of questions. And some of the questions that just that I have are whenever you see this, and maybe, maybe you guys aren't, aren't like this, but this is, this, is, this is one of the first things that I come to is where do demons come from? You know, that God, the scripture assumes that we believe in demons. I mean, we see that throughout the scriptures. So it, so it seems, but I'm like, I, well, well, maybe I do believe in these evil entities, but I don't know where they come from. You know where they come from. And some of these things, we're going to try to answer these questions today. And I think, and it's very informative. So when you look at your bulletin and you see a lot of notes, I am very noted this morning. Uh, so I'm not going to hang, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on any one given point. We're going to be trucking through this pretty quick. But to try to answer some of these questions. And then why do demons possess people? Why do they possess bodies? Why do they, why do they go into things? That's another question that I have when I see these guys. Like, well, why do the demons go into these guys? And then why are demons bad? Like, why, when they go into people, why are they so bad? Why do they make people do things that normally are outside of their character? And then how did, the, how did they recognize Jesus as the Holy One? Like, they saw Jesus. These demons, they've never... As far as we know, they've never seen the incarnate Christ. But when the incarnate Christ is in front of them, immediately they know. There's no question in their mind. We know who you are. You're the Holy One. And then another question I have is, why are they afraid of what Jesus is going to do to them? Like, why are they afraid? And then how, if you do get them or you're oppressed by them, how do you get rid of them if they come into your life? And then, if you're saved, can they mess with you then? Now, do those sound like, do, are those questions, if I asked you those questions, could you answer those for me? No? Well, to I'll be honest, I couldn't answer them for myself. So that is the reason for really this lesson this morning, is so that hopefully you'll be able to get a little bit of information from this, and uh, maybe some of your questions will be answered. And you might even have a better understanding about why you see some things that you see in this life and why certain people do certain things and what's behind it. And then, if you discover that it really is something like this, can you even do anything about it? So that's really the essence of this lesson this morning. So would you pray with me, dear Lord? I just ask that you would just guide our hearts and our minds that we may be, that we may be able to see the truth from your word, not my opinion, not what uh, the internet says, but Lord, what does your Bible say about some things that apparent, that you came in contact with when you were here all the time? And I just can't seem to think that if you met these evil entities all the time, how much do we meet these, these entities too? So I just ask, Lord, that you would just guide us in the understanding here that you will teach us, Lord, from your word today 
how to deal with things that we may not fully understand. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> All right, so Matthew chapter 8. We're going to look at Demons 101. we got some college kids here, so they'll appreciate the 101 aspect of this, hopefully. But demons are spiritual beings. I'm missing something here, I thought. Okay, well, let's just go right here. So we're going to look at a couple things. Demons are spiritual beings. The demons influence territories. Demons fear punishment from God. Demons enter into body. Demons inflict bodily issues. Demons can oppress you. And then signs that you are oppressed and how to rid yourself of demons if they're around you. I know that seems like a lot. And, and really, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this subject because I feel like the more time you spend on a subject like this, the more inviting you are to these things in your life. So we're going to rush through this. And you've got a bunch of my notes. So if you want to study it later, you can study those notes. Uh, in the bulletin, or you can go back, and hopefully this is recording, so you can watch this again if you'd really like to. But let's look at Matthew chapter 8, starting at verse 28. It says, And when he, this is Jesus, was come to the other side, into the country of the Gazarenes, there met him two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs, exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass by that way. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? And there was a good way off from them a herd of many swine feeding. So the devils besought him, saying, If thou cast us out, suffer us to go away into the herd of swine. And he said unto them, Go. And when they were come out, they went into the herd of swine. And behold, the whole herd of swine ran vow, uh, violently down a steep place into the sea and perished. In the waters and they and they that kept them fled and went their ways into the city and told everything that was befallen the possessed of the devils <clears throat> and behold the whole city came out to meet Jesus and when they saw him they besought him that he would depart out of their coast so let's look at this first thing demons are spiritual beings demons are spiritual creatures that they were once angels upon creation, but have since rebelled against God. So what, what am I talking about? In the beginning, God created everything. Some of the things that he created were angels. But sometime in the early part of creation, the, there were some angels that, that defected. They rebelled. They were cast out of heaven. They can no longer go back to heaven, by the way. Psalms chapter 1 teaches that nothing... That no evil can be in the presence of the righteous. They cannot go back to heaven. They cannot visit God because they have a problem with him. They cannot see God there if they want to have a discussion. If they, have to, if they get to talk to God, it's going to be because God is somewhere outside of his heavenly throne room. They are not allowed back into heaven. Okay, that's Psalms chapter 1 teaches, teaches that. But where are these come from? Like how many are there? Well, we don't know the exact number. We just know that in Revelation chapter 12, verses 3 and 4, we get a little bit of a clue as to what is going on with these evil entities. The scripture says, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and the seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. I don't know how, and this is... And all the scholars that, I mean, you read the text there. We know that this is talking about Satan and the ones that followed him. That one third of the created angels follow Satan and were cast out. He drew a third of those. So all of those evil entities were cast down to the earth at that time, according to Revelation chapter 12, 3 and 4. Now let's talk about the devil just for a second. I know I'm going fast, but I have a lot of information to cover. So y'all hang in there with me, okay? The devil, he's got several different names. Satan, Lucifer, the serpent, the dragon, the anointed cherub that covereth the God of this world. Those are just some of the names that we can see Satan appear in the scripture. But really, the, the scripture that tells us a lot, there's two main pieces that tell us a lot about this, this Satan. Which, by the way, Satan means the opposer. He is your opposer. He is against you. He is not your friend. Jesus told, or the scripture tells us that he come to steal, kill, and destroy. And he wants to steal and to 
kill, and destroy you and everything that you stand for, your family. He hates your guts. He is after your soul, and you need to be aware he will not be your friend, and anything that accompanies him is not your friend, and the sin of this world is not your friend, and you are destined for eternal destruction just like he is. But his initial beginning was not that of an opposer or an evil one. He appears to have been created for the glory of God to enter into. What do I mean by the glory of God? Well, in the Old Testament, we see that there was the Shekinah glory of God that would appear and enter into the temple. The priest would not be allowed to go in there, but it would glow so brightly that no one could go in there. Moses met with the Shekinah glory of God a couple times, and his, when he came back, his face would be glowing so bright that they would make him cover his face so they, because they couldn't stand to look at him. They're like, we can't look at you, Moses. You're too bright. It's like you were standing in the sun. Well, he was. He was in the light of the Son of God, and he was glowing because of that. And they made him cover his face because they're like, we cannot be a part of that because you're glowing way too much. So that same light of God, when they would have worship in heaven, would come and enter into this anointed cherub, the Satan, who was made up of all kinds of different gems and as the light of God would shine, it would shine through these gems and make music, according to the scripture. If you would like to look at that, and I, just a look, here's just a little bit of, of, uh, of, of stuff from it, from Ezekiel chapter 28. <coughs> I think this is actually verse 23 where I'm starting. It says, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Well, obviously this is not talking about uh, Tyre or, or some king. This is talking about someone before well, we know that Satan was in the garden, don't we? He appears in the, in, in the form of the snake or possessing the snake at that time. And this, the scripture says, every precious stone was thy covering. And, and then it goes on to say, and it says, and there, were, you were, and there was gold in him and the workmanship of thy, uh, thy tigrets and of thy pipes were prepared in the day that thou was created. So something with Satan has to do with music. Well, the glory of God would come into Satan and he would, and he would shine through it and make music. Now, when you start looking at it, listening to the music of this world and how it's so attractive, well, God made music. He made you to like music, but he also de designed Satan to be the master uh, musician. He knows what is attractive to you and he knows how to lure you away because that's what he was made for. He was made for you to worship or to help you worship. So when he appeals that music to you in this world and you know it's ungodly, and you know it leads to, to false worship in your life, but you're like, I like it. Say, so knows you like it. And he's doing that on purpose because he wants to attract you to his side, just like he did the third of the angels in heaven. In Isaiah chapter 14, we see another little piece of Lucifer. He says, how thou art fallen in Isaiah 14, beginning in verse 12, from heaven. O Lucifer, son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thy heart, and I want you to listen to this part very, very close. Because he begins his rebellion with, I will. The same thing is, I will. Want. This is what Satan, this is the direction that Satan went. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. And God says, you will not. You will be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Hitler had a problem too. He was an I will guy. And if you're an I will person, you've got a problem too. It's satanic. You have a satanic problem. If you are all about yourself or if you know somebody that's all about themselves and they say, I will do this, I will do that, I will do that, I want, I want, I want, and it's all about them, that is one of the most satanic things that that person can do in their life. And, I, and listen, they will be possessed. Satan will make sure that he controls them. That's the problem with Judas. That was the Judas's problem. So 
we talked about the, the, the spiritual aspect, but there's also an earthly aspect in which demons influence territories, geographic locations in this world. We see a hint of that in Daniel chapter 10, and verse 13. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. Daniel's praying. He's, God sent, has the answer to his prayer, but it's being delayed by this prince of Persia. This evil, satanic influence out there withstood. It wasn't Satan. It was a different one that was withstanding uh, Gabriel from being able to bring the message to Daniel. And he did that for 21 years. They're fighting. There's spiritual battles going on. Angels are fighting demons, and we don't see all of this stuff going on. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. So this, Gabriel had to have help. Now, what does the scripture tell us some other places about it? It sure does. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, that there are principalities and powers against the, the ruler of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So there's all kinds of different levels of demonic influences over territories in this world. If you want to see something really unique, I was talking to a pastor friend of mine, but if you would take like a map of the United States prior to the Pilgrim's Landing and, and spreading the gospel over our United States territory, and, uh, and you know when the gospel comes in, the principalities lose power because of the influence of the gospel. They just can't function in the presence of the gospel. When, when Evil gets around the gospel, they must flee from it. They cannot. They cannot operate like they want to. But when the gospel is, is minimized, when the gospel is not being proclaimed, when people aren't living according to the Holy Scriptures and God's commandments, they open up room for these principalities to come back into power. So if you would look at a map of the United States from before the pilgrims, and you look at it, how it's, how it's reshaping, in its territorial uh, aspects of today, you know what you're going to find? It's going to start looking very, very similar. And there's a reason for it. The gospel's not being proclaimed in the lives of many of our people, even our churches. You know, we're, this, this type of message is probably not tolerated in many churches. That I've never heard this message before. No one's ever taught this to me. When I went on Google and asked Google, I'm like, I, I want to know about some demons and how to get rid of them. It told me to throw salt and get a crucifix. That was their explanation. But that is not what the Bible tells us. In Revelation 16 verse 14, the scripture tells us that they deceive nations. That they have power over geographic territories. And they can deceive nations. Now, there's a really unique part of this passage in, in Matthew chapter 8. In which the demons seem terrified at what Jesus may be going to do to them. They fear the punishment of God. Do y'all see that in that passage? Did y'all see that? Why are people not afraid for their souls when demons are? Do you see that? If demons are so afraid of what Jesus is going to do to them, why are we? Yeah, the demons believe and they tremble. We need to believe and tremble. And if our souls and our hearts are not right with God, you should be afraid for your eternal destination. Demons fear the punishment of God. In verse 29 right there, we see... Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? They use that word, torment. Demons are afraid of the torment that they know is coming their way because they rebelled against their creator. You know, the scripture tells this, that hell, this is talking about hell. Hell was not created for you. It was created for the devil and his angels. But when you choose the devil's side, you will go to the same place that he's going to. And the devils, they recognize there is torment there for eternity, and they don't want to go. You shouldn't want to go either. You shouldn't want to go either. They know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. There is a Son of God, and He became flesh, and He dwelt among us. The devils know it. The devils recognize it. Yet we, who He came to die for, reject that notion in so many aspects. And we need to repent of that in our life. And we need to accept Jesus Christ and everything about him and everything about who he is and the work of his salvation and, and live with our whole heart, mind, and strength for him. 
Because the demons, they know that he's the son of God. Man, we need to know that he's the son of God too. We need to know that he is in the control of our eternal destination. You are not. He is. But you know, you can give over your free will and be bought by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And the scripture says that you'll be, that what, what was once dead will be made alive. You'll be made alive in God. And he will give you, he will recreate inside of you that dead soul. He'll bring you back to life. And he's got a different body prepared for you. And he's got a place prepared for you. Those are the ones who say, I, rebe I reject the rebellion against God. And I accept the fellowship of his suffering. Mark chapter 1 and 23 and 24. They said, let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know who thou art, the Holy One of God. Do you know that Jesus Christ is the Holy One of God? They fear the punishment of God. They know that he has ultimate authority over them. It would be very, very wise for you to recognize the fact that God, that Jesus Christ has author, ultimate authority over over you let him have it don't be an i will person be i accept that i will serve you you know i will belong to you i belong to you your will not mine be done they know that there is a place prepared for them and they do not want to go matthew chapter 25 and 41 jesus says this depart from me ye cursed into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels it is not a place for you it is a place for the devil and his angels. He has a different place for you called heaven. Heaven is so much better. So much better. So different than anything that you have seen or felt or experienced in this world. Nothing in this world can compare to what you will experience in heaven. And the scripture even says this, that he is going to make all things new. He's going to fix it one day. And he has invited you to be a part of that. As saints, born again, that if you do not die before his return, you will be raptured when he returns. He has something much, much better for you. In 2 Peter 2 and 4, it says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into the chains of darkness to be reserved into judgment. This is a very, very interesting verse because it kind of gives a hint that there are certain angels that have already been placed in that place of punishment. That there was other things that they did and they were captured. You know, I always wondered with that battle scene that you see in the book of Daniel. I'm like, well, what if the the Gabriel had a one had won or Michael had won and captured the prince of Persia? What he would have done with that guy? Well, I think this verse right here, Peter gives us a hint that they will be put in chains and locked away early. I'm going to show you another verse later on that kind of talks about some of that too. That also, that many have already been bound there because of the things that they have done. You know, that, you know that's one of the things about spiritual warfare that goes on. It's like when there's deep, that's why those demons that, that were in this God were so afraid. They're like, oh, God's called us. We're going to have to go early like some of our buddies have. You know, when you enter into spiritual warfare, it may be that that spiritual war warfare may lock up some demons early because they are messing with your friends and your family and you are getting down on your hands and your knees and you are doing like Jesus said. You are fasting and you're praying and you are reaching into the spiritual wor world and calling out, calling on the angels to attack those demons and to deliver them into the chains of hell early. That doesn't sound like a bad idea, does it? Revelation 9, 1 through 4. Look at this, this scripture right here. Man. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star far from heaven unto the earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. And unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass or green thing or tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. You realize that when you're born again, that the seal of God is placed on your life. And the devils cannot hurt you 
like they can hurt the rest of the world. It's kind of the, the hint, despite what you may believe about some of those other things. But it talks about that, that these things, that, they, that there is going to be a key given and that the ones who have already been bound will be released in those last days. And they will, and they will be coming back to repossess the people. These, are, these have already been conquered in place, but somehow they're, they're going to be released. And, and they're going to go back into the world and re-attack the people that they have been uh, uh, banded from before. From before, I know it's deep stuff. Y'all, y'all try to hang in there with me, okay? In, verse, in chapter Matthew eight twenty eight, it says, "And there met him two possessed with devils." What does this tell us? That demons can enter into pe- people's bodies; that they can possess people. Now, here is my theory on this, for what it's worth. Okay, this isn't in the scripture. It's this is just my theory that these an- that as angels they were creatures in shroud. Enshrouded with God's glory, that they had the same glory about them that Moses' face did when they were in God's presence. But, and that covered them and maybe even gave them their spiritual uh, ability to operate in the physical world, just like angels did. We see angels come in the come in into, into play all through the Old Testament. Even in the New Testament, the Gabriel appears to Mary. Mary's not afraid of Gabriel. She sees a bright light, but she's like, she's concerned about his message. But she, she sees him. He doesn't need to possess her. But demons are not so. Demons are not so. They've lost whatever it is, that glory that allows them to be able to present themselves in that type of spirit in physical form. So I think, and this again, this is what I think, that when they rebelled, they lost the glory of God, and they became naked like Adam and Eve did. I think Adam and Eve had that same glory. And when they sinned, that glory disappeared from all off of them. And they're like, oh, we, we don't look the same anymore. But they had a physical body. God had already given them a physical body. So he clothed them with the skin of an animal. But the demons were not so. They had no physical body to cover. So they must take ownership of someone else's body. So, so they, they, want, they, they want that covering so that they can operate in this physical world. A demon without a body really can't do very much at all. They must have possession of something. Now, they're not picky. We see in this that they're that they're very that they were willing to go into the swine. So they're not picky about what they will what they will use as their body just so they can operate in this world. So they accept the swine that's close by. Regardless, they seem to really desire to have some kind of, of a covering, even if it's the swine. Now, there's other things, and this is, this is why I think that they need that. Um, Matthew chapter 12, verse 20, 43, Jesus says, When an unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and finding none. He can, demons cannot have rest without a body. Therefore, they want one. And they're not picky about what that body may be, just so they can have rest. Have you ever gone a couple nights without rest? You feel miserable, don't you? Well, imagine if you're a demon and you can never get rest and you feel like you need rest. You want, you want to be able to cure that. Well, I think that's kind of the same aspect. It might be a little bit different. So what we see in this is that even many, many of them can enter into a single body if they can find a good host and even develop a personality of singleness the more that are in there. And yet, realize at the same time that there are many in them, just like we see in this demoniac, that they, uh, they have a singular personality of legion, but they know that they are many. Look at Matthew chapter 8, 29 and 31 again. He says, Art thou come hither to torment us? The devils besought him, saying, If thou cast us out, suffer us to go away into the herd of swine. They want to a body. Even Mary in Luke 8, 2, Mary called Magdalene, the scripture tells us that she had seven demons that were in her at the time that she met Jesus. Now, it does not have to be a person. Okay, we've established that it can be an animal like a swan. Uh, but in the beginning of Genesis, it was a snake. Satan entered into the snake, the swan. And there's also in the scripture that God tells us that they can enter into household gods, like little idols that would, that would be dedicated to families. That they could be, they they can indwell those things, 
and they can also indwell other images. They could even indwell whatever, something, as long as they feel safe there. I hope that that kind of makes sense to you. But just know, just because it's not a fit, a, 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 an animate body, it can, be, it can be like an idol of sorts. I think it could be your TV. It could be, it could be some kind of a statue that you've put on your, on your bookcase. That's why it's, it's important to be careful if you, go to another, if you go to another country or you don't know where this thing has been, been made. You know, in the book of Acts, we see that they were, the silversmiths were upset at Paul because people were not buying their silver idols anymore. If you have, because they were, what they were doing is they were bringing go these false gods, these demons into people's house. And they wonder, what is going on with my, in my house? Why are my kids acting so crazy? Why, what's going on with this? Why do they have these night terrors? Let me tell you, demons can do those things. And you won't even know that they're, they're like, well, I'm safe. I'm going to church. If you invite something into your house that is possessed with that, you bring, you're bringing them into your place of abode. You're, in, you're, you're giving them an opportunity to oppress you even if they can't possess you. Now, there's a whole lot more I could say on that, but I'm going to press on. They give their host identity problems and even another name. These people are confused about who they are. They forget who they were, and even sometimes they want another name. They want to change their name. To something else that meets what they think is better suited to their new personality. I hope y'all are listening. Because I know that some of you have seen this and have witnessed it and you are hearing about it. They give their, that uh, some, uh, sometimes they even have different uh, pronouns. Listen to the pronoun changes in Mark 5 and 7. If you look up there, he starts with I and then me and then all of a sudden it goes to we. It changed to a plural pronoun. You know, we thought the change of pronouns was just something in our day. This is all, this was in the Bible. The Bible said it first. And he says it's demonic in its influence. It's name change in Mark 9, uh, 5, 9, that legion is our name. They do, demons do not want you to think about who you are in God's eyes, made in God's image. That's what's going on there. And they recruit other demons. They want a full takeover. They want a full takeover. So they'll go recruiting. They're stronger in their numbers, just like they were here with Legion. Matthew 12 and 44, it says, Then he said, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the, listen to this part. It says the last state of the man is worse than the first. So they go recruiting to make the last state of the, of the person worse than what they were with just the single one in it. And that's exactly what we see. The more you give to these, to these guys and do not do anything about them, the more that they will attract other ones to come and be a part of of their host. Mark 5 and verse 4. We see that he was a wild. He became animal like. That none could tame him. You know I'm even hearing about people saying that they're animals now. You were like oh no not in the, these United States. Mm -hmm. It's becoming much more prevalent. And you're like why? what is going on with these people? What's going on? It's demonic influence in their life. Is what's going on. Sometimes it even gives them great strength. This, this, their, our character here in Matthew chapter 8. He was able to break bonds and chains. They couldn't tame him. They couldn't hold him. Why? Because he was, he had been, he had so many demons in him that he was given extra, extra superhuman strength almost. So these demons, when they get into a person, they do not want to admit God's image on the host's life. They will not. They, do, they, they will fight to try to keep that part suppressed. They want people to think that there's really nothing unique or special about you. Your animal life, your characteristics. There's, you know, that's, I mean, that, that's kind of the central aspect behind abortion. You know, what about the life that's there? Well, demons don't want you to think that there's life there. Because if there was life there, then it would bother you. But if you're like, you know, we're nothing but just a, 
just a part of evolutionary uh, spinoff of one thing to another, that there, God really didn't create us for any kind of purpose. God did create you for a purpose. You're created with immense value in God's eyes. How much value? So much value that God would become flesh and dwell amongst us and have to deal with this character himself. That's how much he loves you. To give you the power which you wouldn't be able to come up with on your own, but through the mighty power of God and the Holy Spirit working in your life, that you have the power to eat, that Jesus said would to do even greater things than what he did to cast out demons, to overcome the, the evil of this world, that Jesus says through the power of the Holy Spirit, I can grant that same influence to you that I have, I can give to you because you've accepted my son as your savior. Mark 5, 15 and 18, it says, he was in his right mind. When you can get the devil outside of people and they can, and they can get to their right mind and they get back to the image of God that's created in them, you'll be just like this guy. You want to be with God. You want to be with Jesus. You're like, I don't want to be in the world anymore. I want to stay with you. There's safety with you. That still holds true. You're safe with Jesus Christ in your life. But when you start venturing outside of that, you are opening up the doors to the evil. Don't open the doors to evil. Jesus is, when Jesus stands at that door and knocks, open it to only him. His sheep knows his voice. They hear him and they follow him. Hagar, she recognizes this in Genesis 6.13, that she says, you, God, see me. You are Elroy, the God who sees you. God sees you. Do you know that? You may think that you're hiding. You may think that, that you can be invisible to God, but you are not invisible to God. He sees you. He's near you. He's not far from you. He's right here with us today. And if you're born again, he's sealed inside of you. He's sealed a spirit inside of you. He loves you. He sees everything that's going on in your life. Psalms 139, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. One of the things about demons, when they enter into bodies, is that you will see that they flaunt nakedness and sexual expression. We see this in Leviticus chapter 18. You can go read that whole chapter yourself, and you can see all of the sexual expression that comes out when demonic influences take over, and part of that process is flaunting nakedness. Luke 8, 27. It's this character had, which had devils a long time, and the scripture says wear no clothes. That whenever you, you see nakedness being flaunted and sexual expression taken over, Know that demonic influence is involved. I know that's not popular preaching in our modern culture. But you, you know, we're all going to have to come to this. We all have this day in which we're going to stand before Almighty God and our knees are going to bow. And we're going to have to give an account of everything. And he's going to say, why did you give in to that? I thought it was a good idea at the time. You thought it was a good idea to give into the expression of devils and demons in your life. And you wonder why your life was turning out the way that it was when you continue to give in to those type of things. Repent, the scripture would say. Turn from that wickedness. Do not invite those things into your life. Flee from them, as James would say. And, and turn to God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. They had this idea when demons enter in. This is just kind of a summary with this point. They have an identity crisis. They recruit more devils. They're wild. They reject God's image on them. And they flaunt nakedness and sexual expression. Now, demons can inflict bodily issues. And here in Matthew 8, we see that he's exceedingly fierce. In Matthew 9, 33, muteness was in that one. Now, don't think that every time somebody has this issue, it's demonic. There may be some other things. And there will be multiple things. Okay, when a demon is inside, there will be multiple characteristics of demonic activity inside that person's life, not just one. Does that make sense to you? Because there could be other things that happen to make somebody mute 
or make someone have some kind of an issue, like a deformity that we see in Luke 13. But in this case, it was a demon, a demon that was doing that. Uh, blindness in Matthew chapter 12. Um, erratic behavior in Matthew 17, where it was like epileptic and seizure type thing. It doesn't mean that every time somebody has a seizure that they're being taken over by a demon. But if there's multiple things going on that... Uh, that, that show symptoms of demonic activity, just like if you're going to get a, if you're going to get a diagnosis for a disease, right? There's going to be multiple symptoms that go along with that disease. So the same thing is true with demonic in, uh, possession in a person's life. Um, they harm others in Acts chapter 19. And then even divination is sometimes part of that. I'm not going to get all into that, but they are able to communicate with with up past with demons uh, that have been around other people and they know their history and that they're able to communicate certain things with that. Um, demons can also oppress you. Now, demons cannot possess a believer that has been sealed with the Holy Spirit. I totally believe that. That the Holy Spirit prevents them from messing with you, at least in a full possession like that. However, a person can suppress the Holy Spirit in them and do things that invite demons to oppress them. That means when you purposely engage in sinful activities, you are inviting demonic oppression against you. You're, you're telling the Holy Spirit, no, and you're telling the demons, yes. When you do that, you are putting yourself in a position where they can oppress you because You've taken, you've taken away the, the protection. I'll give you an example of Job, right? They couldn't me Satan couldn't mess with Job because God had a hedge of protection around him. Satan had to give permission to mess with Job. Well, if you are living right for God, he's going to have a hedge of protection around you unless there's some kind of a special lesson that he wants to teach you through, and use Satan to do it. But Satan cannot mess with you if the Holy Spirit's inside of you. When you belong to God, you belong to God. He doesn't let people mess with you. And if people try to mess with you, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. So Satan, but you can take yourself outside of that hedge of protection and allow the devil to mess with you. And that is a dangerous place for you to be. So remember, uh, I already talked about this a little bit, but they can live in images that are in the house. You know, the, um, you know I'm not going to go into all the demonic things that you, can, that you can bring in. But if it has demonic uh, stuff about it, like it's been used for those things, like Ouija boards, dream catchers, those type of things. Don't be surprised when weird stuff starts going on. And you're wondering, I don't understand this. You need to start looking around. What have I invited in my life? Yeah, you may have the Holy Spirit still inside of you, but you've invited a demon to live with you. Why would you do that? Maybe you don't know. Well, I'm telling you, be aware of those things. Maybe you're not taught. I haven't taught this that well. I get it. No one taught me. I'm just saying, be aware. They will go and they will stay in a place where they feel safe there. And they can only do that when you allow things to happen that are inviting. Do you understand what that means? If you're gonna invite, if you're gonna watch pornography, if you're gonna watch uh, movies that that reveal nakedness and sexual expression that's out of control, you are inviting these things. And that, and I hope that you don't think that that's just my opinion. I think you can base that off of the scripture. Deuteron look at Deuteronomy 32. It says, They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. You see, that's what they did in Israel. The tribe of Dan, they even stole the household images that Micah had in Judges chapter 18. So Dan, so Dan whenever Jeroboam comes on the scene, when the, the, when the kingdom split, of Israel splits between Israel, uh, Rehoboam and Jeroboam, Dan was ripe to set up false worship in its city because they had already had the household gods from, from Micah set up and established there. 
Peter says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And that is why for the lesson today, that is the point of this lesson, so that you are sober and vigilant, and you know that you have an adversary, the devil, and he wants to eat you alive and wants to destroy you. Ephesians 6 to 11 says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Protect yourself against these things. And if you think, well, you know, I think I'm good. I, I, I think I'm good enough. Look, the Satan came after Jesus and tempted him 40 days in the desert, according to Luke chapter 4 and verse 2. By the way, Jesus, he refuted the devil with scripture every single time. Now, here's some signs that I think that you can sell if you are being oppressed. You have secrets and lies in your life. Do you know if you're oppressed? Here's a sign. There are secrets and lies in your life. John 8, 44 is a reference for that. You have also accepted lies from other people. You want those lives. You've accepted them. And you are going along with their lies. You have abnormal fears. 2 Timothy 1.7, God has not given you the spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. Fear is not from God. If you have fears, you're being oppressed. And you're like, oh, no, I, I, am I really? You thought that that was just human nature. Yeah, it is human nature. You're not supposed to have human nature. You're supposed to have spiritual nature. You're supposed to be serving the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, not the Prince of this world. Don't have abnormal fears. Those, that's a sign that you're being oppressed. There's an inability to rest. I just can't rest. I can't sleep. You're probably being oppressed. Prolonged depression. There's a lot of depression in your life. You've got bad thoughts. Maybe you even do some bad things to your body. Prolonged depression. It's, everybody's going to be sad. Everybody's going to have a bad day. But when you live there, that's not normal. That's oppression. There's an overreaction to emotional events that usually has an illogical response. Matthew 27, 5 kind of talks about some of those things. And then there's an inordinate or excessive desire or temptation of having your own way. You want your way. You don't care about what, who it affects or, how it, or what it's going to look like tomorrow. You're like, that's what I want today. I'll tell you what it looks like. It looks like a trend of bad decisions. If you've got a trend of bad decisions in your life, uh, you have this problem. It's a sign of demonic oppression, not possession, okay? They can do this without being in you. You may even have body ailments. King Saul had an evil spirit that would give him like migraines. Second Corinthians chapter 12, Paul uh, was given a, a thorn in the flesh from a messenger of Satan. Now this is Paul, okay? You're like, Paul didn't have that. Paul too. He had oppression. But you think about where Paul was. He was in the midst of pagan lives. And, it, and, and when you're in the middle of that stuff, it's going to mess with you. And here it is, it messes with Paul's body. And God tells him, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. What does he tell Paul to do? Lean back on me. I think Paul had some good days and some bad days. Now, how to rid yourself of these. This is what I want you to listen to the most. I know we're going a little bit long. Hang in there with me just for a few more minutes because this is important because I know every single person in here has had this pro has had demonic oppression and you have seen influence either in yourself or in those around you. How do you deal with these things when they're there? Well, the first thing that Jesus would tell us is fasting and prayer. It's all through the scripture, and Baptists don't like to talk about fasting and prayer. But Jesus says, Howbeit this kind goeth not out but by fasting and prayer. That's it. If you think that you can get a whole tub of salt 
You can get all the salt in the ocean and throw it all around you. That's not going to keep the demons from messing with you. You need Jesus Christ in your life. Amen? You need Jesus Christ there. Fasting and prayer, removing those things that are, uh, that are drawing those evil entities into your life. And here's another thing that I think we can see from the scriptures. The candidate must want freedom from this influence or at least somebody around them wants it for them. If you take one of those factors away, all you're going to do is clean a person up and that demon is going to go out and come back with more worse than itself. Another way to get rid of, to rid oneself is that you don't want to, you want to make sure that when you're trying to do these things that you don't invite a susceptible host in your life. You know, a lot of times that's what people do is they know that they got a problem, so they invite somebody that they know has similar problems. They're not going to help you. You're just going to make each other worse is really what you're going to do. What you need to do is you need to find a good God, God believing Bible preaching, a little bit of fire and brimstone maybe in there a little with that person too, to come along and tell you the truth about what's going on in your life and to tell you that sin and sin invites devils into your life. And if you commit abominations, then you are opening yourself up to possession of uh, those things. That's what you need. That's what I need to make sure I do right all the time. That's just accountability of making sure that we live for God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I don't want some other poor soul to around when I'm trying to do this. We're not going to help each other. The process may not be fast either, and it may be violent. Mark 1 and 26 says, When the unclean spirit had torn him and cried out with a, cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. Others, too, may become very upset at you. You know, we think that everybody wants the best for you. We see in Matthew chapter 8 there that the whole city turned against Jesus because he helped these guys out. They didn't want him helping them. It may be that your friends and your families do not want you to be helped. And they may even try to influence further demonic activity in your life. It may be violent. And others may become upset. Number five, Titus. This is kind of long, but listen to Titus. He says, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers and obey magistrates. What does that really mean? It means recognize the influence that you are around and be ready to speak to every good work. Speak evil of no man. Be no brawlers. Be gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, and deceived, serving divers' lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy and hateful and hating one another. What is Titus 3 telling us? He says, these things, if they're in your life, you've got to get them out. You've got to get them out. If you want to get rid of those things, you've got to look for these symptoms right here. James 4, 7 even says this. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. That really is the key to this. Submit yourselves unto God. 100%. Get rid of all the things that are evil in your life and submit yourself unto God. What does that mean? Well, you can start with the commandments, but really what you need is your heart to be changed. God, deliver me from the evils that I do and admit that you do evil. Admit that there's sin and reject the sin. Resist the devil and he will flee from you according to the scripture. Walk in the spirit. That means the obedience to God's commandments. If you don't know what, the, what God's commandments are, you can start with the ten. That's a really good place to start. And ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, according to Galatians 5 and 16. And surround yourself with truth. Deuteronomy 6, this is Bible study. Memorizing scripture. God's word on your walls, in your car, coming up on your phone every time you're looking at it. You need God's stuff all the time. And you need to view God's stuff. Listen to God's stuff, not all this other stuff, especially if you know that you're having some demon issues in your life. 
Most of all, be saved by Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter how much of this other stuff happens. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it's all in vain. And you're just making yourself a better candidate for Satan himself to take over. Give yourself to Jesus. Do you know him as your Savior? Do you know how to be saved? Maybe you don't know how to be saved. This is what the scripture says. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. And thou shalt be saved. Call for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. Shall what? Be saved. Not maybe. Shall. Shall. When you believe Jesus and you reject this world. And when you do that, you'll live like it. And Satan will be upset. Isn't that a good entity to make upset? It is so much better to have Satan upset at you than God upset with, up, with you, right? I do not want to stand before God and he tell me, depart from me, you're a work of iniquity. I never knew you. I want him to say, reach out his hand and say, welcome home, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in a few things. I'm going to make you an owner of many things. He's got a place for you. You know, I know that the, that the satanic world and the demons of this world are reaching into all of our lives through all kinds of different means. That's why the scripture tells us to fight the good fight of faith. That's why we're supposed to resist the devil and to submit ourselves unto God. Hey, if he's been messing with you, you I'm going to give you a few, uh, a, a few minutes here in a, in a minute. Brother Sean and Isaac, would you come? You don't need to tell me all your sins. I do not want to know them. But God wants you to recognize things in your life. If there's some things going on, deal with it. Don't wait. Today is the day of salvation, the scripture says. Don't put it off to tomorrow. Don't let those things get worse in your life. Accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today. It doesn't matter if you've been in church your whole life. That will not save you. Your parents will not save you. Only you submitting yourselves to God Almighty will save you. Would y'all stand and pray with me? Dear Lord, I want to thank you uh, for this message. I know I took a little bit longer today, but I, I just felt like it was an important one to give to your people. And I pray that you will bless them, Lord, with these words, that they will be able to recognize how to overcome the evils in their life and to honor you with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. So God is the word in these things. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.